Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 526. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's August the 23rd, the slow season. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, clerics and laity alike, welcome to another show. We're here to discuss Anglicanism, Christianity, and the fun province around it. Um, Before we get started, you have certain responsibilities, and that's to make sure people understand that we're out there. We need you to like us, share, subscribe to us, do all the little things. You see these little icons appearing on your screen, that little thumbs up. That means you need to like us on Facebook and YouTube. There's that little subscribe bell on YouTube. Click that to be sure you're subscribed. We want to be sure that you get instant updates the next time an episode comes out. Uh, And it's, as Gavin referred to, the slow season. There's always news. We'll find it. We'll talk about it. Gentlemen, how have your weeks been going? Looks like uh, Gavin's in a secret location. Well, I was thinking on how remarkably and refreshingly unfluid your introduction was. (laughs) (laughs) Very binary. And in these days, a bit of binary can be very reassuring. Anyway, so yes, if I wriggle a little bit, George is suffering from gout, which I'm very sorry. And Mm. I've I've been many hours on on a motorbike and... um, and I found it shocking for two reasons. The first is my posterior uh, isn't isn't um, isn't as fit as it should be for these things. And secondly, that I decided to listen to the Gospel of Matthew. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. I strongly recommend listening to the Gospel of Matthew being read out. It um, it it, it re- reminds you of things you might otherwise have overlooked. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me, we have a podcast for those listeners. <laughs> who can't uh, gather and, and just watch us on YouTube. So, uh, yeah, I get to listen to audiobooks, and I've been listening to lots of uh, uh, some of the, the recent Christian fare out there. It's, it's a, you know, very educational because nowadays I don't have time to sit down and read a book anymore. George, you are a prolific book reader. Well, I do my best. Uh, th- this is the our slow season. A uh, good, good third of our congregation are away this time of year visiting family or they have summer homes and places like that or they travel a lot of retirees and within the life of the parish this is also the best time to sort of do uh sort of i don't want to call it esoteric but sort of different christian education and sort of capture people's interests because um christianity uh if you just only took advantage of its public face in America, it's pretty shallow. In other words, it's uh, sort of happy clappiness. And it some really solid Christian education that ties in culture and literature and faith and life and theology, that really is exciting to people. So one of the funny things is, is I have as many people coming to Christian education on a Sunday morning to study, uh, you know, we just did the libretto of Parsifal and the uh, and the Grail legend, and we'll be doing stuff like that. I've had many people come to that as I have come to worship, and people would say, "Well, how in the swamps of Florida? Uh, we we're not we're a lower middle class parish. We have very few people. I think my wife is the only one with woman with a professional degree, um, which is different from most Episcopal churches. A lot of blue-collar work people, retired policemen and things of that nature. And yet people are hungering for an understanding of their Christian faith that works out more than just something soft and silly like the Joel Osteen TV shows. So perhaps I'm in a reflective mood, but it's really exciting to see people who've never been exposed to the glories of our Christian heritage, you know, just getting it. So if all they know about the Holy Grail is Indiana Jones, <laughs> it well, really just it's, it so opens up so much of the life to see, you know, this has been around for a thousand years, and this has deep Christian symbolism and meaning. I can't tell you how many times I've read the Bible through. Lots. But every time I open it, there's something new. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think that was the, 
the, the God's desire for Scripture that it was not just a static book on a shelf, that it, it comes to life in the, in the life of a Christian. And I find that in church as well. There's something new. And I find that in Anglicanism, even though I read a prayer book, even though I have daily office, there's something new here. And it's, it's an, an encouragement and mm. embodiment uh, that draws me closer to the Father. And yeah, it, it was a well-designed thought plan, whoever put that together. There's a very good book out this summer called by an Australian journalist called Greg Sheridan, called God is Good for You. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things he does is to ask why it is that the West seems determined to forget Christian culture in a way that um, the George's parish isn't forgetting it. Because I think, George, your parish and perhaps bits of America that you represent are, are kicking the, uh, the um, not kicking the habit, but are, are working against the grain. Sheridan's book is, is, a, is a really quite well-written expose of why it is the West is turning against the faith. But, but back to what Kevin was saying, Every time I listen to chunks of the Bible being read out to me, um, particularly uh, particularly from something like the Gospel of Matthew, you know, when one's reading the Gospel, John's the mystical one, one likes to get lost in and, 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 and mark for a bit of fun, and Luke soothes you. I tend to avoid Matthew unless I have to, because I know he's really hardcore and fierce. But I, as I listen to the fierceness of Jesus, uh, the fierceness designed to, to, to rescue people who were up to their neck in something that was going to kill them. I Just like Kevin was saying, uh, one realizes that, that there's so much one hasn't heard, that, that one, one needs to hear. We have to put ourselves in the way of listening to the word. It has such extraordinary power to bring us to life and to rebuke us and to shock us. Uh, again, I, I, I thought, no wonder you didn't have many followers, Lord. This is harsh stuff. <laughs> it's hard, yeah. Well, every time well, somebody I, I, came to ask him about money, they left unhappy, you know. <laughs> so. But there's, there's such a, there's, there's a one-size-fits-all mindset in so much of the church today, uh, especially coming from the, the management culture of the church. And one of the things we've been discovering here is that, that the neglect of the aesthetic, the neglect of the sensory, uh, solely in favor of the pragmatic, does have consequences. When you try to dumb things down, when you try to package things down, and don't allow music, art, literature, uh, all of that to be an adjunct to speak to you with in, in hand with Scripture, you're closing the door to... You're making life impoverished. And as I look at the Episcopal Church, as I look at the Church of England, it is so terribly impoverished because they have forgotten so much of what has gone before and replaced it with which what is so, is so silly. Well, the, shock, I, the shock that I had listening to Matthew was the reality time and time again of, of evil, uh, the reality of Satan, the reality of sin, the enormity of the spiritual struggle, the fact that some people were never going to get it. I mean, God, you know, God alone knows what happens on the last day. But, but this division between those who get it and those who are somehow rendered soporific or passive or supine by Satan. And I, I, I thought, you know, why don't we read, why don't I hear this read out in church? Have the lectionary people really pruned anything high octane away so it never disturbs the people of God? So much of the eight chapters I listened to of Matthew on, on my motorbike in the, uh, in the dark dusk, I haven't heard when I was in church for a very long time. Hmm. Well, it, it's interesting because there has to be a limit as well. I don't want to wake up and find that George installed a helter skelter because he wanted to uh, <laughs> <laughs> let the people of his parish experience God in a new way. Uh, I woke up and I saw a picture of a bishop at the top of a helter skelter give a sermon before he rode down the slide himself. Uh, have we talked about that? We talked about the Helter Skelter. We've not talked about the bishop yet. What's the update, uh, Gavin, from the Church of England on this? Well, this story is running and running. It must, it must be because it's August, but, but yet again, I was reading the Times this morning, and, and there I am described as, as, as a, a, a rent-a-quote misery guts or something similar. 
um, on the back of the Helter Skelter in Norwich. So yes, this this bishop uh, stood up and uh, uh, preached a sermon. I, I think one of the things this is doing is to divide the church uh, quite usefully, really, into those who see the church's role to captivate, entertain, I think seduce, really. It, it, it seems to me that this whole exercise of entertainment in cathedrals is an art of seduction. It's to try and, it's to try and titillate people's interest, to bring them in to, to the holy place. But then I'm not sure anything happens at that stage. I'm not sure, for example, I, don't, I mean, I haven't heard what Merrick said in his sermon, uh, nor have I heard that there's been any, any conversions or repentance as he hit the bottom and clutching his mitre. But one, there's a very interesting theological point here. I'm, one of the books I want to write before I come to judgment is about uh, coded humor in the New Testament, because I think there's an enormous amount of it designed to make us laugh at ourselves, to shock us into some form of a moment of disclosure. But, but, it, but it's, it's there in order to try and open us up to the reality of God. It, it, Jesus doesn't do a lot of stroking and entertaining. Um, he's always provoking and opening people up. And I, my fear is that, that in, the, in the interests of trying to get people's attention and seduce them into a relationship with God, which is not a very good way of doing it, that, that Anglicanism uh, is, is seeking to, um, to entertain people. And I, I, don't think it, I, I don't think it's going to have the right effect. Well, I think Christianity is about to see its biggest growth because George posted an article by a Jesuit priest that said Satan is just a social construct. He's not real. He's a symbol. And, well, if, you know, if there's nothing to stop Jesus, it's all, it's, it's all up and over, George. What's the story you have? Uh, Father, I want to say Jose Sosa. Father Sosa is the superior general of the Society of Jesus. He's the head of the Jesuits. He was uh, appearing at an Italian church conference and was stopped by Tempe, an Italian ch church magazine. And he was asked four or five questions. And the very last question about immigrants and all the sort of social justice stuff that Francis is quite keen on. Italy is the government has just fallen and the Catholic church is quietly campaigning against the conservatives for and for open borders. And so the, most of the questions were about that. But then there was a final question which says, so uh, Father Sosa, is the devil real? Now, Father Sosa in 2017 got in a bit of trouble because he told the Spanish newspaper El Mundo that the devil is not a real person. He's just a construct to, uh, as a label for evil. In other words, in uh, Mephistopheles, uh, uh, Goethe put into the words of Me Mephistopheles that uh, Satan is the negation of all good. And what Father Sosa is doing is elevating Goethe to the uh, primacy over the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which says Satan's a real person, Satan's a reality. And so the, the good Jesuit very helpfully repeated his remarks and amplified them saying that Satan is a cultural construct. We can't really take it literally. It's sort of the uh, negation of good and all this and that. And essentially the Francis project of turning the Catholic Church into the worst bits of Anglicanism is well underway and it's being led by the Jesuits. It's interesting because in this culture, uh, Jesus at most was a good teacher. He certainly wasn't the savior of the world. He certainly wasn't a person who had any divine influence. He was a, just a good teacher. For the atheist, he's just a social construct. He's something the church created so that they could have power and white privilege over society. And I think this is the same type of argument, Gavin. Sheridan, in, in the book I was talking about earlier, talks about how we've moved from soul to self, yeah. um, a preoccupation with the soul to a preoccupation to the self and the therapeutic culture is all about the self. I think the really important thing about uh, failing to treat evil seriously is, is, apart from the fact it's a mistake and it isn't true, is it has knock-on consequences about the kind of discipleship that we enter into and the kind of God we, we believe we're serving. Um, as you read the Gospels, it becomes very clear that the demonic spirits that Jesus is dealing with uh, and Satan himself 
are enormously real. E even if uh, Satan appears at the beginning of the temptations and reappears just before Gethsemane and his, his, his minions are causing most trouble in the middle of the gospel, nonetheless, it's sandwiched by this profound presence. And of course, the book of Revelation gives us a, a, a cosmic meta-narrative. What happens if you take this away? I think the answer is that um, as, as with any conflict, if you underestimate or get wrong the, the opposition that you're facing, the, the danger is that you, it, it may overcome you. you. You may not know what you're dealing with. You may not know the weapons you have to use, the kind of struggle that you're engaged with. And those of us who've been attacked by the demonic or have, have had, had to encounter it, much, much to our dismay, find our prayer lives a, a different kind of prayer life. Uh, the, the Eucharist becomes more important. Uh, it, it, in my case, Mary takes on a significance that is more than the ingenue Zeffirelli-like teenager who's, who's clean enough to give birth to the Messiah because Mary is Eve Mark II, the one who, who, who demonstrates that humanity can be changed into a new paradigm. There is a if you take evil seriously, and and in most in most particularly our Lord's triumph over evil, we then find ourselves, uh, if you like, as um, uh, as very serious combatants in a very serious uh, war. And I think that's one of the things that makes a quality of spiritual life different from those who slip into therapy, the self self improvement, uh, and have no sense of the danger in which the soul stands if you listen to the Gospel of Matthew chapters 8 to 16. <laughs> well, Kevin, let me, let me, if I may, Kevin, let me sure, just sort of push this up a bit and say uh, we have uh, the Superior General of the Jesuits saying uh, the devil is the spirit of, the, of negation. It's a cultural construct. And I'll ask Gavin, and I'll ask Kevin, is the devil real and why do you think so? Do you think it's a real being? I think it's Why? a real entity, sure. I, I don't know if he has a Why? name. Why, uh, others, Why can't you be all, all modern and trendy like Father Trendy of the Jesuits? Uh, why, why do you persist in uh, holding on to these sort of folk beliefs? What, what is your, what's your reason? George, I'm being one, day, <laughs> one day I was in a French town called Le Puy, and I was going to, to uh, attend the Eucharist in a chapel of St. Michael on the top of a stalactite. But, 400 meters high, a kind of mini Saint Mont Saint Michel, and um, for reasons that no don't need going into, this this was the year I came under serious attack by the devil. It was 2008, and it was the period in which I was changing my views on sexuality, amongst other things. And whilst I was at this service, everything went blank. I thought I was having a stroke, and I looked up and I saw above me, uh, like a like a you know like a circ sort of a plug hole, you know, with things going down a, plug, a, a tornado. I saw, I saw bats, things that looked like bats, and they were bombarding my head uh, in a kind of, like a sort of tornado coming down, you know, wide at the top and narrow. And they came with fear and accusation, and I couldn't hear anything. And I thought, I must be going mad or I'm about to have a stroke. And I won, there were, part of my brain stayed alert, and I thought, well, this is clearly evil embodied in some kind of way that, that for once I could see and experience. What I really want to know is when the evil stops, because this is the Eucharist taking place in a very holy place dedicated to St. Michael. They have no business to be here. If they were to exist, why would God allow this? So at some point, they're going to be seen off during this Mass, and I wonder when it is. Meanwhile, I wanted to run out screaming because I was very afraid. I was seriously undone. Um, I watched the priest, even though I couldn't hear him, and he elevated the host, and I thought, you know, maybe this will see them off. And, and nothing happened. And then, then, uh, then I went forward, and he, he he placed the host in my hand. And I thought, this must do. As soon as the host touched my tongue, it cleared. They disappeared, as if as if someone had, had switched something off. Now, um, I, I I wasn't on drugs. I wasn't having an episode. There wasn't any trigger. Uh, what was the fruit of this? The fruit of this was make me pray more and repent a lot more. Um, and I've had that's probably one of a half a dozen of those kind of experiences I've had over 40 years as a Christian, though they happened very much at the beginning and then not at all. And then in the last 10 years, the, once once Satan has come out from behind the shadows, once you've seen him, tasted him 
and associate above all his his main characteristics are accusation and despair uh, it's all your fault and you're going to hell to sum it up and and of course everyone experiences that everyone experiences this dreadful undoing sense of oh it's all my fault why, why do i bother staying alive and everyone is terrified of condemnation whether or not it's professional or, or, or local. In other words, everyone has these experiences, but few people get to trace them back to the metaphysical or origins that produce them. And therefore, few, if you don't do that, you can't really combat them because you don't know how to pray or which, or which way to pray. But once you've had that experience, nothing would ever make you believe in him as a contra. I'm quite cross with St. Augustine of Hippo uh, because he, he he's pushed this idea which has furnished, I think, some of the theological reflection the superior the Jesuits was, was talking about. You know, he talked about uh, Satan as being uh, the, the absence of good. And, and in one sense, it's true, but it's not true as a whole theology of evil. It's only a small aspect of it. And, and it mustn't be allowed to stand for it. Otherwise, you miss what's really going on. Yeah, there's no question about it. Uh, in my understanding of creation, the closest that I experience, the closest walk I can have with the Father is one where I am suffering for Him. It's just one of those things. You are drawn closer in suffering. And in as such, uh, it affects my nature and the understanding of evil, of Satan, and um, the construct we have of the kingdom. It's just, Kevin, it's do you, been helpful. Do you, do you believe that it is just suffering for him? Because there have been times in my life when I have suffered tremendously, and it's not because of my faith. Oh, no, I, it, it, suffering in general. Uh, things have happened. Absolutely, suffering in general. Uh, it has been, in my life, a cause exclusive to walk closer. Uh, suffering for Christ has been an even deeper walk with uh, the Father. Um, now, let me tell you, this isn't 40 years of experience. I've, I've suffered the most mm -hmm. in the last three or four years. Uh, the, these things finally cinched in, oh, that's why, that's why there's, you know, and it just, well, it's kind of these wake up moments of, uh, knowing why uh, I walk so I know why when I wake up in the morning everybody gets to see what I see I, all three of us are, are WYSIWYG what you see is what you get um, we don't just become more holy when I press the record button you know the Gavin who shows up in, the, in here in the morning his hair is a little undone sometimes you get a haircut you look nice that's the Gavin you get to see once I hit record. George, who's sitting there always writing little letters to members of his parish for before we start the show, um, the, his loving faithfulness as a, a priest, that's what you get here on the show. Kevin, the entrepreneur and, and starter of ministries, I'm WYSIWYG, this is what you get once I hit record button. And all that is kind of the formation of suffering at different ports of our points of our life that have drawn us closer onto the father in order um, to understand suffering more there's a very interesting book that's just come out called in sine jesu in the bosom of jesus yeah. and it's and it's dictated it's the voice of jesus to an, an abbot in an irish monastery uh, some people will think it's it's uh, the abbot's imaginings but i read four or five lines of it in a in a document and i went oh that's jesus i know the voice and, and I, I went and got it and it's a very it's a very very moving book indeed written mainly for priests but to everybody but one of the things our lord says in it is something that that i'd caught a small glimpse of and needed to understand more which is that that metaphysically our lord still suffers um, the, the passion still continues and uh, what he asks is for, for for those of his friends who are willing to suffer with him to stand by him in, in, in this particular book, uh, partly for the Blessed Sacrament, but, but as he suffers on the cross, as he suffers by the, the rejection of those he's come to find, one of the aspects of the suffering he invites us into is to find our suffering made more sense by offering it as part of sharing his suffering. In other words, we're, we're back to soul rather than self. We're back to placing it in a cosmological metaphysical framework rather than something that just needs dealing with stoically or for our own sake when when that happens 
the, the privilege of sharing his suffering changes our relationship with what we're going through. It, it, well, one of the keys here is the suffering doesn't make sense when you're suffering. And I want to transition this into a story out of Australia where a cardinal has been found guilty in a situation that just doesn't make sense. The evidence just isn't there. The story, the narrative, the testimonies aren't there. Yet this gentleman is going to suffer for a very long time uh, for the sake of Christ and because he's guilty by association. And I thought this is a great transition here to talk about uh, George uh, Pell. Um, George, give us the, the, the latest update on this. But, uh, Cardinal Pell, uh, George Pell, was convicted of uh, child abuse. Mm -hmm. The uh, incident allegedly occurred in the sacristy of the cathedral where he molested a choir boy, uh, a, a molested a young boy while he was fully vested. And there were two accusers. After a mass, there were two accusers. One died, and the other uh, is still with us. Uh, one has subsequently died. The other's with us. And their testimony was used to convict Cardinal Pell. And the trial was closed, and so there wasn't much reporting going on. Because, uh, but what was coming out was that this was a travesty of justice. And then it was taken to appeal, and by a vote of two to one. In a 300-page opinion, the courts upheld the uh, lower court ruling. Now, Cardinal Pell can uh, take it one more bite of the apple of getting an M-Bank, I believe is the phrase, decision from the full court of appeal. And the the issues aren't legal, they're, some, they're more factual, in the sense that the allegations made against him are so fantastical. They're on the sort of McMartin preschool level, if you're an American, if you know mm, what I mean. Sure. Of uh, so fantastical allegations of abuse that physically, uh, logically could not have happened the way they were happening. But a jury was convinced that they did happen. And so it's difficult for Cardinal Pell because it's not a question of misapplication of law, but rather that the jury didn't believe him. And so now he's facing six or seven years more imprisonment unless he's released on appeal. So that's that's the legally where things stand right now. George, can I just add to some of the facts? The, the, one of the things that's made a lot of people believe in Pell's innocence without knowing him is first of all, the demeanor of the man and his moral courage in other fields of his Christian life. But but secondly, this was this was supposed to have taken place at the end of mass before he went to a vestry. And anyone who knows anything about a Catholic mass in a cathedral knows that the, the, the clergy are always in procession. They're surrounded by acolytes, deacons, people who are doing things. There's a great deal to be done. It, it's inconceivable he would have walked from the end of mass to the vestry by himself. It's inconceivable that people would not have passed. And he was very heavily vested. And without being unpleasantly graphic, um, uh, an elderly large man, very heavily vested, would have to be very gymnastic to do anything of the things that he was claimed he did in a very, very short period of time that it would need to have taken. The whole thing is so extremely unlikely for anyone who knows anything about the Mass, the Cathedral, or Pell. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, that even given this, he was it was quite clearly people decided to find him guilty. One imagines as, as, a, as a form of sacrificial uh, a sacrificial person for, for the whole, you know, even if, well, if Pell didn't do the abuse, lots of other clergy did, and they got away with it. So here's Guilty one. by association, absolutely. But we had a cardinal here in Chicago, Cardinal Joseph. McCarrick. Bernadine. Was Bernadine, Chicago. yeah. Uh, who was accused by... Uh, a person he uh, helped counsel when he was before he was a cardinal, and this guy had the memory. He went to a prosecutor. He went to his attorney. And said, "This is exactly what happened. I remember it like it was yesterday." He wrote it down, and they were about to go to trial. And uh, this guy woke up one day and just withdrew his testimony because he said it didn't happen. And it's it's just one of those things. You're like, how? 
this guy, this cardinal who's served faithfully for many many years uh was just had already retired was uh, about to you know move on and he had to put up with this type of thing and i'm like I may have misspoken i'm not sure that was cardinal bernadin uh, uh, i was looking up Wait, isn't because it because cardinal bernadin generally considered to have done bad things okay uh, well, there there was a cardinal of Chicago who did, who was falsely accused, and I don't know if it, I don't think it's Bernard. He was ninety six. I'm looking one up here. People, one of the points that people have made is that is there are cardinals who have done very seriously Absolutely. bad. Sure. Like McCarrick is probably the obvious example at the moment. Who, who's who's been hitting on seminarians in a in a in a grossly serious way for a long time with everyone knowing about it. Now McCarrick is still at large. Uh, the, the, he suffered a few sanctions. Well, but, he has but, to live in a convent in, uh, in Kansas, so uh, <laughs> that's not just a mild sanction. But one of the things that people have done is to draw on a comparison between Pell, who most people think is innocent and, and is suffering despite the fact it's obviously innocent, and someone like McCarrick, who everyone knows to be guilty right. uh, because of the width of testimony about him, uh, and, and the church is doing nothing about it. I I think... Well, I'm not sure where one goes from there. It's sex to say that, 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 that George Pell will be sharing the suffering of, of many Christians who've been unjustly accused for being Christian because it's made so much worse by, by people who have committed these misdemeanors and therefore give fuel to society to throw. I, at, I, I, don't, uh, I don't know whether Pell is guilty or innocent. I have my uh, opinion on that matter. I believe he's innocent but I don't know the answer. But what I do know is that in my life experiences, I have, my experience of the satanic has been most real, most closely in church settings. I have been at Episcopal uh, events, uh, Episcopal, uh, you know, in my capacity as a reporter or visiting general convention, where I've had to withdraw, where I've had to leave the middle of a Eucharist uh, hosted by one group because I had to throw up. Sure. Because the palpable reality of evil, of Satan, of the de of demons, was real to me. Now, I'm a hard-nosed evangelical where I like it written in the Bible and logically and choppy, and I can chop it up the way I want. Yet, the uh, experience, I mean, why do I believe in a real devil? Because the Bible tells me so, and because I've experienced it. And I've and here's where I'm going with this point: is that I've experienced the devil most clearly in corrupted church environments and institutions. So is it? So here we have someone like Pell, who I believe is innocent, and then we have the devil working through someone like McCarrick. Um, well, and I'd like to move on to George George Bell. I, I've, sure. I would in the newspapers the other day that that um, there may be some legal comeback against the hierarchy of the Church of England on the grounds that they 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 knew that Bell was innocent but nonetheless trashed his reputation uh, our, our Lord says that even if you don't have George Conger's sensitivity to the presence of evil you can still nonetheless tell the difference by the fruit by, by what works out and I think there's something really dreadfully corrupt and evil in, in terms of the way the Church of England has behaved uh, over the victims of sexual misdemeanors, but particularly in terms of the way they've dealt, dealt with George Bell's reputation. I, I'm uncomfortable, Gavin, with what you just said, partially because I've experienced a number of people in parish ministry who see the devil everywhere, who uh, blame the devil. You know, it's, all, it's the old Flip Wilson, the comedian's joke line, the devil made me do it. So my... so saying I have a sensitivity to Satan really makes me uncomfortable because the how does one put into into logical sequence or words a uh, sensory experience or a, or a spiritual experience because I, he I hear some of these people talking and they talk about the devil and this and that and they're psychotic Okay, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be pejorative, but I'm saying no, their no. experience 
is a psychosis. You, you've put your finger on, on perhaps one of the most difficult things of all. One of the reasons I gave up in believing in the devil, despite the fact he gave me a very hard time in my first five years, was because uh, I found myself involved in, in the whole arena of, of, of dealing with mental illness. Uh, and I couldn't cope with, with mental illness and the metaphysics of evil because I couldn't tell the difference between them. And in fact, I think actually on reflection, there is a terrifying overlap between them. But at this point, um, uh, the uh, that wonderful philosopher, um, who come to varieties, William James, William James comes to our aid because one of the things he says is the same thing as Jesus says. In the end, uh, you can afford to take, make a judgment when you see the end result. It worked out in people's lives. So the fact is the people who see Satan everywhere and blame him for things that they should take responsibility for are not lives that have an impact of an inspirational kind upon you or anybody else. Actually, they do the opposite. They make one disbelieve in almost everything. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't people whose antennae are, are well tuned. Um, I, I think, it's, I'm not sure it's very different between people who can sense the presence of God and those who can't. I was listening to somebody, a woman called Julia Hartley Brewer, talking to a priest called Giles Fraser. She was saying that she had almost no sense of the presence of God ever in her life. And I think there are some people whose who's antennae, who, they can't hear the tune. They're especially turned deaf. But the fact that um, the fact that some morally and mentally ill people misuse a concept of evil should not dissuade us from doing the hard work to look behind the distortions that their moral and psychological incapacity create. We just shouldn't give up, as I did for about 25 years, and say, well, this is too difficult uh, or too improper. Indeed. Uh, you got something, George, before we close out? No. No? Okay. Uh, I just looked it up. It was Joseph Bernadette who was uh, falsely accused, the Cardinal of Chicago. I'm glad I didn't say say badly. Bad no, things. Sorry. no I, he could have had other bad things in his life, but the accusation was, was a false accusation. Gentlemen, it's been a wonderful week, and I'm glad we could finish out the week recording another Anglican Unscripted. Uh, you're in your secret location, uh, Gavin. You coming back to England anytime soon? I'll be back in ten days. Ten days, uh, George. You're closing out your August here. Uh, you're not taking vacation yet. I thought you're heading out to a, a different location in November, but we're not going to make that public, are we? No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, no. We're geographical gnosticism. Uh, we're having so much fun. I'm stuck here in the humid east coast of Connecticut. That's the way it works. I'm Kevin uh, Carlson. I'm I'm Kevin Carlson. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and I'm also George Conger on alternate weeks. Yeah, I, I too suffer from a small degree of multiple personality disorder, but I try and keep it secret. So for the purposes of the show, I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's August the 23rd, and you've been listening to episode 526. God, God be with you. Pray, learn to pray the prayers of St. Michael. It's very effective. Boy, this is as wizzy wig as you get. <laughs>